Welcome back, Word Nerds. Mike here with the Social Life of Language, making complex theory simple but never simplified. If you think that sounds cool, hit that subscribe button now. Today we're looking at an article from sociologist Eduardo Bonilla Silva titled The Linguistics of Colorblind Racism, How to Talk Nasty About Blacks Without Sounding Racist. This is also in the latest edition of his book, but I'm intentionally doing this really old article so we can see how white college students talked about race more than 20 years ago. Interesting phrasing, the way you just said that. No, it's cool, I can totally say that. Some of my best friends are black. So we're looking at research more than 20 years old, but while reading this, I kept having the feeling of, has anything fucking changed? Let's find out. So this article analyzes the way two groups of white identifying people, one of them being college students, the way they talk about race or the verbal strategies used during the time Bonilla Silva described as driven by colorblind ideology, where the best way to solve race problems is to forcefully assert that race does not matter. More recently, the ideology has been shifted or rearticulated after Obama was elected. We might call this post-racialism. There is not a black America and a white America and Latino America and Asian America. There's the United States of America. But I think my favorite description is by Kimberly Crenshaw, who described this as post-racial pragmatism. So we talk about race as though it doesn't matter while also celebrating difference and racial achievement when it's safe to do so. In other words, race doesn't matter, but good job on all those racial achievements that I'm not acknowledging right now because race doesn't matter. So Bonilla Silva is gonna cover five verbal strategies white identifying college students use while getting across their views on race in the colorblind world of 20 years ago. But first, how do we define racism? Bonilla Silva says elsewhere that when whites and non-whites talk about racism, they're actually talking about two different things. White identifying people tend to believe racism is driven by essentially irrational beliefs or a psychological quirk of particular individuals that emerge in isolated incidences. When people of color think of racism, we might think of racism as baked into social institutions, the way laws are written, the way we segregate housing markets, the way banks loan money. Basically, everyone participates in conscious and unconscious ways, in passive and active ways. We tend to perceive the interests that fit people's racial location in society. Okay, let's look at verbal strategies one and two. First, there's the avoidance of racial language. And second, there is the use of popular semantic moves or popular ways to frame situations during race talk. So at an obvious level, people generally avoid racial slurs. But when they do talk about race, often they'll put it on someone else to avoid responsibility for the words coming out of their mouth. Like if you heard, I'm not racist, but my friend told me a really racist joke, you wanna hear it? So explicitly framing this as knowing it's racist, but I know what I'm doing because I'm not racist, Plus, it's my friend's joke, not mine. We see avoidance on a lot of levels, but this avoidance is often paired with number two, popular semantic moves and phrases, like claiming to have a close interracial relationship with someone, which then supposedly gives them the authority to talk about race from an objective standpoint. Interesting phrasing the way you just said that. No, it's cool, I can totally say that. Some of my best friends are black. Oh, okay, um, what's their name? So I can maybe ask them if they wanna be interested. Oh, their names? Shanene, Lawrence, Will, Yum, Smith. Will Smith? Oh, what's that? Or there also could be the avoidance of race talk altogether. Like when asked about racial discrimination existing, a popular phrase Bonilla Silva uncovered was some variation of, I'm not black, so I don't know. Another popular one was taking both sides of an issue, which he covers in the section titled, Yes and No, But. Oh, I'm sorry, is it too bright in here? 
Uh, yeah, it's a little bright, but I can... I need my glasses either way, so that's cool. That's cool. So Mark, how do you feel about affirmative action policies? Yes and no. Uh, this is probably, you know, the toughest thing I have deciding. I really, because I've thought about this a lot, but I can make a pro-con list and still wouldn't, like, I've heard most of the issues mm -hmm. about this subject and I honestly couldn't give a definite answer. Uh, if I'm that person getting rejected, I'm not going to support it. Uh, if I'm in that majority getting rejected just because of my race. This both sides strategy sounds very familiar. I think there's blame on both sides and I have no doubt about it and you don't have any doubt about it either. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. Let's move on to number three, the role of projection or blaming someone else for what you might be feeling by accusing them of having those feelings. Or sometimes this comes out as the accusation of reverse racism. Let's meet Janet from SU. I think they segregate themselves or I mean, I don't know how everybody else is, but I would have no problem with talking with or being friends with a black person or any other type of minority. I think they've just got it in their heads that they're different and as a result, they're pulling themselves away. Okay, so projection sounds familiar too. Um, on the campaign trail, you called yourself a nationalist. Some people saw that as emboldening white nationalists. Now people are also saying that the president- I don't know why you'd that say that. such a racist there question. There are some people that say that yeah. now the Republican Party is seen as supporting white nationalists oh, because of your rhetoric. That. I don't what do you that. make of that? I don't believe it. I just, well, I don't know. Why do I have my highest poll numbers ever with African Americans? Why do I have among the highest poll numbers with African Americans? I mean, why do I have my highest poll numbers? That's such a racist question. Honestly, I mean, I know you have it written down and you're going to tell me. Let me tell you, it's a racist question. And Mr. Uh, President, I'm I gonna love ask You know what the word is? I love our country. Strategy number four, the use of diminutives. So these are words that make stuff sound small and insignificant in order to soften a racial stance. So instead of just saying, I'm against affirmative action, we might hear, I'm a little bit against affirmative action. Or maybe, I'm a little unsure about affirmative action. For example, this guy named Andy, when talking about his professor, he says, like, I mean, if you hear a professor say something like a racial slur or something just a little bit, you know, a little bit out of hand, you know? I mean, I mean, I would just see it as like, you know, he was just, you took it out of context or something, but you know, it's just little things like that. So just a little racial slur, not a big one. And finally, we have number five. That is the rapid descent into total incoherence. Favorite. Listen to Ray talking about interracial dating. I mean, I would never preclude uh, a black woman from being my girlfriend on the basis that she was black. You know, I mean, you know, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, if you're looking about it from, you know, the standpoint of just attraction, I mean, I think that, you know, I think, you know, I think, uh, you know, all women are, I mean, so to review Bonilla Silva's list of powerful verbal strategies. We got number one, avoidance. Number two, the use of common stock phrases and semantic moves. Like, I'm not racist, but. Number three, projecting racial beliefs onto racialized groups. Like saying, black people are reverse racists. Number four, the use of diminutives. Saying stuff like, I'm a little bit against interracial marriage. For the kids, you know, they're gonna have such a hard time. And finally, we have the prestigious number five which is becoming totally incoherent while hoping for the best interpretation of the jumble of bullshit that just came out of your fucking face. So 20 years later, have things gotten better? Yeah, things have gotten better. We're much better at being racist, much more effective. For example, saying something like, I'm against school segregation, but I'm for the freedom to choose the school my child goes to. 
which just happens to be 99% white rich kids. Or some of my favorite ones are the implementation of diversity programs. Those say something like, look at all of this paperwork that proves we're attempting to diversify our staff and someday we'll actually hire somebody so long as they're qualified. So it's about school choice, not race. It's about qualifications, not race. Or as Bonilla Silva might say, we tend to blame racial hierarchies on everything but racism. Anything but race. All right, that's all for today, folks. Be sure to hit up my Patreon account. That shit helps so much. That has been a game changer to this channel. If you're new, like and subscribe. As always, I'm Mike, and this is The Social Life of Language. And we're done.